So these are my disclosures from my lifetime. So who is really the undecided prostate cancer consult? It's not so much who is, but what are the things that lead to being undecided? Well, we'll start with someone completely overwhelmed by information, of course, because we have the internet. A lot of people have sought multiple consults. That gets confusing. Um, some people might be unsure of their priorities. Uh, are they looking for cure? Are they looking for quality of life? We're obviously balancing those therapeutic ratio questions all the time. And, uh, you know, obviously the individual side effects of therapy are, are playing into, you know, this kind of, I'm not sure what to do and will I regret what I'm doing? But why does really this matter? It matters because we're dealing with cancer and these are very high stakes games and the treatment choices impact, you know, obviously both survival, but I'd almost say in the prostate cancer world, and we're talking about the localized prostate cancer world, more importantly, actually quality of life. And so the risk of decisional regret, <clears throat> if the path isn't thoroughly explored, and by path, not pathology, but the treatment path, uh, is actually fairly high. So let's kind of break down what are, what are maybe elements of the problem before we talk about is decisional regret <clears throat> even really a problem. And this study is a little bit dated, but it's, but it's interesting. This was from 2010. And it was a really fascinating bias kind of question about <clears throat> looking at men that were in the Sear Medicare database. So they, the question was, if you were aged 65 to 69 years old specifically, how did multidisciplinary consult for localized prostate cancer change management? And so if the only person you saw, and this is sort of E&M coding for consultation, uh, the way the study was done, if you really only saw a urologist per se, for primary diagnosis, then there's something like an 80% chance you got surgery. That's those little surgical mask green people. There was only about a 4% chance that you were gonna get radiation therapy. Those little yellow syringes are primary androgen deprivation therapy, which is obviously for localized prostate cancers and something we would routinely do, yet it happens. And those little clocks at the bottom are active surveillance or expectant management in the era when this study was done. If you saw a radiation oncologist plus a urologist, surprise, surprise, we're very convincing people. We can con a lot of people into getting radiation therapy. So when you have both of the consultations, you will see that maybe we're very persuasive or also maybe an element of this finding was if the urologist was even sending them to the radonc in the first place, maybe there was also some bias in the urologist's mind uh, over the surgery and you can see very little primary ADT or surveillance. Well, what about a urologist plus a medical oncologist? Well, look at those little yellow syringes. You know, we're getting a, lo a little bit more primary ADT. We're kind of balancing things out a little bit. And when they get all three, this is kind of what you see. What's the point of this slide? The point of this slide is we can influence a lot what people do just based on who they see. I don't want you to read too much into it, but it is kind of interesting how the patterns of care shift um, depending on the multidisciplinary engagement. So I started um, training, you know, really in the early 2000s, and this is what localized prostate cancer looked like to me. It's the Costco food court menu. You only had a few diagnostic tests. You had a rectal exam, you had a PSA, you had a Gleason score. That's really all you needed to know to risk stratify anybody, right? Oh, no, they're D'Amico this. Uh, and, and your treatments were pretty simple. You could have a radical prostatectomy, you could get some kind of beam radiation, you can get a seed implant, <clears throat> maybe you can get hormone therapy. Well, the menu's changed. If any of you have eaten at the Cheesecake Factory, you'll recognize this menu. Cheesecake Factory is known to have the biggest, most paralyzing menu on the planet. And so now we have a localized prostate cancer patient and we're talking about, should we get a 4K? Do we get genomic testing? What about somatic testing? What about MRIs? What about PSMAs? What about whatever? And then we haven't even gotten into treatment. And then we go on to the treatment side of the menu and of course we have just this multiplicity of treatments that again <clears throat> is, is the dilemma of choice, uh, you know, a paralyzing amount of options and this makes it very challenging for patients to consider what therapy they want to get. So let's break down the elements of the problem further. So we talked a little bit about physician bias, we talked a little bit about too much choice and now I really want to talk about my favorite subject which is mythology. And we all hold, both as urologists, radiation oncologists, medical oncologists, a lot of mythology that frankly have been disproven by prospective randomized trials. And I wanna go through some of the bigger ones that I see and show you the data and try to convince you that some of the things you believe are inaccurate. 
and that some of those things you may believe and hold true are also leading to uh, decisional regret and indecision. So we're gonna play Mythbusters Genital Urinary Cancers Edition. So we'll start with myth number one. It doesn't matter which one you believe, like either surgery or radiation is more curative for a low-risk prostate cancer patient. Well, one way to bust this myth, and this is particular to low and intermediate risk patients, is the PROTECT trial, which we all have heard a lot about, the PROTECT trial randomized men with effectively favorable and low, and low risk patients to either a form of active surveillance, not precisely active surveillance, but radical prostatectomy versus intense, not actually IMRT rather, that's an error, 3D conformal radiation therapy with for some bizarre reason three months of ADT, which you wouldn't routinely do in a low risk guy, but nevertheless is what happened. And you can see the oncologic outcomes here. Prostate cancer specific survival, you can't even tell that there are three different treatments there. They got data going out 17 years, no one's dying of prostate cancer. Metastasis free survival, there is a little bit of difference there. The difference is if you get a definitive treatment, there's no difference. Whether you get surgery or beam radiation, the metastasis free survival was no different. There was a little bit of a decline noted for active surveillance, but this is about the mythology of maybe surgery versus radiation therapy. No difference, at least in oncologic outcomes. So I'll say that there's a busted myth if you believe one or the other is more curative, at least for that risk group patient. Well, what about high-risk prostate cancer? Very interesting, a lot of attention and a lot of dog fighting in the journals over the last couple of years. You should do this, you should do that for high risk. Um, <clears throat> there's not so much randomized trial data here, but one of the better papers I could come up with is a large multi-institutional analysis. And this is the very highest risk, right? Gleason 910. And this was published in a journal that many of you probably haven't heard of called JAMA. So, you know, ostensibly that's a pretty high impact journal and they did their due diligence. And there are three treatment groups here for these Gleason 910s. Uh, you have prostatectomy, you have external beam radiation therapy with hormone therapy, and then you have the same plus brachytherapy. And even though it looks like the addition of brachytherapy here wins, and I'm not here to prove that radiation is better or not, what I really want you to focus on is that EBRT plus ADT, which is the orange line, or prostatectomy have really the same outcome when you talk about prostate cancer specific survival or distant metastasis survival. There's a lot of former ABS presidents in this room, they would love to point to this and tell you that adding brachytherapy does in fact have these outcomes. I actually believe that adding brachytherapy has these outcomes. I have a bias, is one of my biases, when I see a very high risk prostate cancer patient to add brachytherapy. But at least for the most commonly performed treatments across the country, um, there doesn't appear to be a difference in the oncologic outcomes. So I'll say there's some busted mythology there that maybe radical prostatectomy is somehow better or worse or, or beam radiation is better or worse. So how about another myth? Well, that's all great. You can look at all that population data, but in my expert hands, in my fancy NCI Comprehensive Cancer Center, or I trained wherever, you know, I have better outcomes. So it doesn't really matter what you show me. I know because I'm super smart and awesome that things are better. So we did this at our institution. I work at an NCI Comprehensive Cancer Center. It's the Huntsman Cancer Institute, University of Utah. And we kind of, in a way, duplicated this this same study that I just showed you. And interestingly enough, um, we show very similar outcomes. The brachytherapy on the left, the colors are different, but, but we have a similar kind of pattern in our center. It doesn't matter if you're high-risk prostate cancer, if you get radical prostatectomy or beam radiation with hormone therapy, you're gonna have the same ultimate outcome on metastasis-free survival. We also see this bump with brachytherapy where we improve outcomes. But I will say the myth is a little bit confirmed because our outcomes were a little bit better at 10 years, quite a bit actually. Our metastasis-free survival rates um, at the 10-year time point were something like 80%, let's say, as opposed to, if you look at the graph on the right, about 60%. So I'll say that maybe there's something to be said for uh, multi-D expert consultation at big cancer centers where people do a lot of volume. Um, all right, well, that's all great. Tor those are great studies, but you know, the PROTECT trial was 3D conformal radiation and we weren't using robots and, uh, there's a lot that's changed, and so now, because we're in the 21st century, in the year 2025, uh, now I know there's a difference. Well, let's look at that. So this is a fantastic prospective randomized trial called the PACE A trial, where people were trying to head to head what was sort of considered the best, most modern techniques, which is, uh, you know, basically robotic radical surgery versus SBRT. 
And so, and so the, the myth all that we're trying to see here is like, is one more or less toxic than the other? So if we look at urinary incontinence, and red is prostatectomy, SBRT is blue, I will say that at least for that domain, the myth is confirmed, RT wins. But if you look at urinary obstructive symptoms, then I would say that RP is better. I'd say plausible because they come together at the end, but there's definitely curve separation there and some time for urinary irritation being worse for radiation therapy. So RP wins there. Uh, and what about some other domains? Well, here's the bowel domains from this trial. Well, okay, here again, I'll give it to radical prostatectomy. Like, you guys are confirmed, radical prostatectomy, better. Uh, but what about sexual function on this prospective randomized trial? Well, sorry folks, RT wins there. So, you know, the point is there are differences. There are differences between what we do. There are differences by technique. There are differences, um, you know, that lead to these different domain outcomes. One thing I didn't show here, which is really important to point out, is it's really easy to look at individual domains and say, oh, this is higher this, this is higher that. Unfortunately, I don't have a slide here, but when you globally ask patients overall, do you care? Are you happy with your quality of life? Like, forget we measure this, we measure that. Are you happy with your quality of life? It turns out that there's very little difference between men who choose a radical prostatectomy path and a radiation therapy path. So I want you to kind of keep that in mind, that we use these individual domain tools to try to con or convince people into doing one thing or the other. But at the end of the day, it's really a can't we all just get along. The truth is we're all serving the patient. And really, most people are quite happy with their outcome. But it's important to communicate these risks. So now I want to address what I consider the biggest myth <clears throat> of all. And I will challenge anybody in this group to, to tell me I'm wrong about this. But this is a widely held myth, not just by urologists, but also by rad onks, that radiation treatment side effects get worse over time, but uh, it's not so much with radical prostatectomy, where if you, you take your lump up front, then you're fine. So younger men should always get RP. In fact, we just saw that case, 48-year-old Ashkenazi Jew, genetic mutation, like, well, of course he went to radical prostatectomy. Well, part of that bias was the age. Part of that bias was the age. Let's look at that. So let's go back to the PROTECT trial. If you have some effect where radiation therapy is worse over time and surgery is not, then you'd have two, two lines where they deviate like that. And then the radiation keeps going down over time and the slopes separate. But if we look at the epic domains, here's urinary bother out 12 years. You can see slopes are the same. There's no increasing risk changing over time relative to surgery, let's say, on urinary score. Incontinence, the slopes aren't changing. Myth busted. S erectile dysfunction, the slopes aren't changing. These are parallel lines between surgery and radiation going out 12 years. Sexual quality of life. Bowel function, no difference in slopes. It is not, radiation is not is not the gift that keeps on giving, with the only exception of secondary malignancy rate. And I know that you're seeing in your clinics, I know you're like, well, I see these guys, they get radiated, they come to my clinic and they've got stricture, they got whatever. That's true, because everything we do causes some side effects in some subset of patients. And so you see those patients and you have to fix them, but you're getting an enriched view of the toxicity because you're not seeing the 98% of people that aren't being sent to your clinic and it leads a little bit in a bias. So if you don't believe the PROTECT trial data, uh, I would like to point out the CSER data. This is prospectively collected patient reported quality of life data. This is uh, Dr. Brockus's group out of Vanderbilt, fantastic stuff. Here we added brachytherapy in there. Again, what I really am trying to have you focus on is the slopes are not changing. So that myth is busted. I'm not gonna go through all these things. So is decisional regret a real problem, actually? We talked about all the things that might be lead to that. This is, again, from Dr. Baracus in the Caesar study. They looked at this, 2,000 men, and they tried to break down what happens. Here's where you get decisional regret. If your perception of treatment effectiveness is not meeting reality, then you have a lot more regret. And if your perception of treatment adverse effects 
were not communicated well compared to reality, you get a lot more regret. So because I'm running out of time, I won't go through all the little domains. But what's effectively going on here is about 15% of men who get radical prostatectomy have significant regret. About 10% of those getting radiation have some kind of regret. And about 7 or 8% of people on surveillance have some kind of regret. And so it really comes down to you're not setting the expectation correctly. So this is the last slide. I apologize for going over. How do we fix this? You have to have multi-D consultation, be treated, you know, counseled on all the options. That'll reduce it. You must be, it must be presented by the respective specialist. Do not reiterate bias or myth. Be very transparent about the side effects, healing times, probability of cure. You have to consider, of course, the emotional support of the patient and follow up with the patient afterward to make sure that you set the expectation and that you're paying attention on the back end. Sorry for going over. I really appreciate this opportunity and uh, I hope to chat with you all later in the meeting.